Good evening and welcome to District Council. It's our ordination service and we're so glad that you're here to celebrate and, and worship God with us. The service will have a time of worship and then we're gonna hear a, a powerful message and then following that, we'll have the ordination ceremony. And then when all of that is done, there's a reception um, to just honor and celebrate those who have um, done the work and been recognized with their credentials. But we're so delighted that you're here to celebrate with us. Would you stand this evening? And we're going to pray. And, and during our first worship song, you'll see the, the leadership come in. But this is just a time where we're just going to celebrate Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that we have this evening to gather together, most importantly, to exalt you and to celebrate, God, the good things that you have done. God, our prayer this evening is that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord, you are worthy tonight to be praised, Jesus. All the glory goes to you, Father. Jesus. song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Oh Lord, you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
God, we are thankful that there is salvation in your name. That at your name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess and that you invited us. Tonight, we even celebrate that you invited us into the story of redemption. You invited us and you called us to follow you and that you promised if we did that, you would make us fishers of men. And so we celebrate that tonight with our brothers and our sisters, that we don't go alone, but we go in your name with your authority. And we are so thankful for it. We're humbled that you chose us. So be glorified tonight, Jesus. Be lifted up in everything that happens tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, do you love Jesus tonight? Amen. Amen. Well, as you're seated, tell your neighbor that they look are looking very good tonight. Come on. <laughs> Well, welcome. Welcome to a very special night at District Council. We are so glad that you're here. Those that are uh, guests here tonight, family members, you've come on a very special night. And this has been a great council. God has showed up in a powerful way today, last night, and this morning. We're just simply amazing. The King is here. Amen. And uh, so it's been a great time. We want to give you an opportunity to participate uh, in giving for this council. And so I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward at this time. If you're not prepared to give right now, you can go on to the district's website, NE for Nebraska, NEAG.org. There's a place that you can click give and designate that. But we're going to ask the ushers to come forward and we're going to give as given unto the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you are here, that we're not just gathered together to celebrate one another, but to celebrate you and what you've done. We're so glad to be a part of a fellowship that's about your mission. And tonight we wanna to invest in that. And so we give with a thankful heart and we know that you're gonna bless it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. Sorry, I thought they were going to do another song. It is a privilege for us to be able to honor a man of great esteem in my eyes. Bob Nazarenus is, was a superintendent for many years, most of which while I was here. And uh, you know what, Bob? It looks different from this side of the bench. <laughs> Makes me honor you even all the more. We want to give you, in recognition from Springfield, Doug Clay, the general superintendent, and in honor and recognition of 50 years of ordination. Not just ministry, ordination. And a pin, and you get to do that. You've seen these before because you handed them to somebody else. <laughs> Bob, 
You can take that if you want to. Uh, I, I thought it would be a great opportunity for him to be able to share with you what it is from his experience, what is the value, the spiritual value of ordination? Now, he can't preach. He can only a little bit. <laughs> Never could. <laughs> He's so quick-witted. <laughs> But would you, would you mind sharing with the body just that spiritual dimension? What is it that makes ordination special? Thank you, Pastor Bob. Thank you all for being here tonight to celebrate with us. Uh, before I make any remarks, I want to introduce my wife, Mary. I asked her to come with me. And she said, oh, I don't need to go up there. And those of you who know her, that's her. Would you stand, please, Mary? Our two daughters and sons-in-law are here with uh, two of my grandsons, uh, Jeff and Renee Tyson, and uh, Don and Carrie Nelson. And I'd like to have them stand, please. Pastor Bob gave me this assignment, and uh, he told me I could go as long as I wanted to, but you're all leaving here at 10. We have loved the Lord and enjoyed his presence many, many years. Thank God for it. Someone said to me out in the foyer, uh, man, 50 years. I said, yeah, that's a half a century. And... Uh, God's been so faithful and so good to us. And when Pastor asked me to give just a few words, I, uh, I showed him this notebook. I said, I brought my manuscript, and he about passed out. But no, uh, I know what it's like to have these kinds of services, and uh, I appreciate and value so much the opportunity to share with you uh, for just a moment or two. Ordination is spiritual significance. As I mused on this assignment, uh, I do a lot of what uh, some of you do. You walk and pray, pray and walk. Only I have a security guard dog with me when I'm walking and praying. He's 13 years old now, and uh, He's a grand total 5.2 pound, vicious, vicious Yorkshire Terrier. And uh, as I was out with him one day, I was just thinking about this. And for a few weeks earlier, I was thinking about ordination. And as I think about that, one of the foundational core values of our fellowship is that we believe in a God called ministry. And that cord of a God called ministry in our fellowship means that God calls leadership ministry and ministers. You don't get it over the internet for $250. You don't wake up one morning and say, boy, I'd like to be a minister. <laughs> there were some mornings I woke up and I thought, oh, brother, uh, I thought this was Monday. And Mary nudged me and said, no, it's Sunday. You got to go to church. <laughs> but that cord of a God-called ministry weaves through the entirety of both Old and New Testament Abraham, Moses, Aaron, his sons who were ordained and anointed as priests, the prophets, Queen Esther, raised up for such a time as this, kings who were called and anointed by the prophets of God. It is recorded in the New Testament Gospels 
that there was a man sent from God, and his name was John. The Baptist was a powerful preacher of the good news that the kingdom of God had finally arrived. Jesus, after calling his 12 disciples, also called 70 others. And he says, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And after Calvary and Pentecost, the church, his body, is called and commissioned to proclaim the glorious good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ that guarantees that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. And he said, after Pentecost, to go out and preach this glorious gospel, and he promised signs following that preaching. It was a vision which had a worldwide scope and still does. As the church develops through scripture, the heart of God designates leadership ministry gifts. Paul put it this way in the book of Ephesians, and he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip the saints in his church to do the work of the ministry. That's called multiplication. I like that. And so, ordained, set apart, consecrated to the service and ministry of God, his saints, and the world, we are the called ones for the offices that he has put in place in his church. We do this tonight by affirming the call of God in men and women through this ordination service. And as the elders lay hands on the called out ones for this specific glorious adventure of being one of God's oracles to salvation, as the elders lay hands on you, I believe that there is a spiritual anointing that will be bestowed upon you by the blessed Holy Spirit of God, and you will not be the same. You will be filled with his power to bring glory and honor to him as you declare the whole counsel of God's word. Such a call from God will break the yoke of bondages that are in the people's lives as they are called from darkness into his marvelous light. May God continue to bless you with his love, his joy, his peace, his grace, and the Holy Spirit's power to do the work of his kingdom for his glory and for his honor. Amen. As you can see, our beautiful, shy Mary did not make it up here. And so, but we know that behind every good man is a mighty, wonderful woman. Mary, I want you to stand until I get down there. <laughs>
50 years. That's a lot. Well, it's great just to be able to honor that. We're going to now turn our attention to a speaker, a man that God uses, called of God. Uh, heard his testimony of how God called him. It was, it was a beautiful thing. We, who've been here for a few days, a couple days, heard him already this morning, and it was powerful. Would you agree, those of you who are here? It was outstanding. And I just, for those who you don't know him, he uh, was called and been to missions, and he was a missionary, has been a missionary in India. He was there for uh, quite a few years. He then went to Laos, and he built up a mission team that now continues the work. My point is, he doesn't just go to a college to teach. He goes there to reach the unreached, the most unreached people group. He then came back, and now he's back in India again. And I'll tell you what, if you talk to him personally, talk to him about his house where he lives, and there's hardly any heat in the house. Now that's missions, right? The heart that's there, I just want to ask, Don, uh, would you just join us here and come on up? And I just want you to welcome him. He is a man that God uses in a wonderful way. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. What a great evening to be here. For uh, those of you that are getting ordained tonight, I congratulate you. You know, for somebody who was raised heathen, being a part of a, uh, a movement is an honor. I think sometimes we take too lightly the blessing we have of this wonderful fellowship of men and women who have laid a foundation for us that we can be a part of, and we welcome you to this wonderful family and look forward to seeing what God is going to do in your lives. Well, tonight I said this morning that I would continue talking about things that matter if we're going to make a difference. This morning we talked about sacrifice. Tonight I want to talk about relationship. Everybody say with me relationship. <clears throat> Luke chapter 15, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. In Luke 7, 34, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You know, I'm afraid today that uh, the accusation that was brought against Jesus, and this was the number one accusation against Jesus, more than claiming and saying he's bad because he said he was the son of God. The number one accusation against Jesus was this. He sits and eats with the wrong kind of people. He hangs out with the wrong folks. He needs to be with people like us. And why is he hanging out with those people? And I'm afraid today if you hired the best lawyer and handed him all the evidence you could find, that nobody would convict the church today of being a friend of sinners. We are angry with sinners. We preach against sinners. We judge sinners. We revile sinners. But you would be hard-pressed to find a sinner who actually believes those guys in the church are my friend. We have lost the Spirit of Christ. And if we are going to be transformative in our mission to see our cities, our towns, to see our world change, it will begin when we again walk in the footsteps of Christ and begin to share our lives with those who need Jesus the most. I mean, I, I love you guys, and I'm glad we can spend time together, but we spend way too much time together. 
When is the last time you had a meal with a sinner? When is the last time you had someone from another religion sitting at your table sharing a meal with you? Because that's where life happens. In our team in India, we say it all the time. The gospel doesn't need another pulpit. The gospel needs more tables. And if you want to transform your city, your cities will not be transformed by what happens behind the pulpit. Your cities will be transformed by who's sitting at your table. And if you look at Jesus, some of the best stuff Jesus ever did, he did it sitting around a table. He was constantly sitting at tables, sitting at wells, sharing life, sharing a meal, sharing his life with those who needed him the most. Statistics tell us this, 81% of all Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists do not know a Christian. 81%. And the sad thing is, part of that 81% is your neighbor. They live across the street from you, and they still don't know a Christian. They work in your building, and they still don't know a Christian. God has brought them all the way to America. I can tell you, we don't have a refugee crisis. We don't have a refugee problem. If you are a follower of Christ, then we have a refugee opportunity. You, you have a choice. Either pack your bags and go to Somalia or reach the Somalis in your town. That's your choice. So I think you better say, thank you, Lord, for bringing them to me. Because <laughs> it's a whole lot more difficult to go reach an Afghani in Afghanistan than it is to reach an Afghani who's living across the street. We need to share our lives with those who need Jesus the most. To me, when I got saved, I can honestly say, no one ever shared the gospel with me. I was 20 years old. I was an alcoholic. Came from a broken home. My mother left when I was a teenager. My father walked out the door soon after that. I raised myself, fell into violence and drugs and alcohol. My life was spiraling out of control. And in all my years of death, no one ever gave me a tract. No one ever invited me to a table. No one ever shared the gospel with me. But God was so gracious to me, he reached out his hand. I was riding home from a bar late one uh, Sunday morning and Jesus Christ showed up in my life. He just came out of nowhere. And you would think that would make you happy, but I was terrified. Because the only thing I thought I knew about God was this, God kills bad people. And I knew where I was in the equation. So I drove my truck home, I ran inside of my house, and I knelt beside my bed all night. I didn't know how to pray. I'd never said a prayer. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to talk to him. I was just terrified. Morning came around, I could see the sun outside, and I thought, maybe there's hope. So I went back, got in my truck, rode back into the town. The first church I saw with the doors open, First Assembly of God, America's Georgia, pulled into the parking lot, walked in the church, sat on the front row. I didn't know front rows were reserved for like, you know, like religious type of people. And I had my Budweiser t-shirt on and ripped up blue jeans. And, and uh, I was at least the youngest person in the church by 50 years. You ever been to a church like that? And the ushers had to ush that morning. They had to do something. They were a little nervous. What this guy doing in our church? Is he here to rush the stage? <laughs> What's he going to do here? So I had an usher on either side and one in behind me. And they were just <laughs> waiting just in case. And so uh, worship started. And I don't know if you remember these days, but the worship leader started by saying this, don't listen to the way I sing, just listen to the words. You ever heard that? That's when you know the worship is about to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> So she started. I mean, you guys got great worship, but it was bad. The second thing I learned about God was God likes bad music. So 
And then he started preaching, and he was talking from Revelation. He's talking about black horses and white horses and red horses and pale riders and vials and trumpets. And after an hour of church, I was so lost. And I just thought, man, maybe I came to the wrong place. This isn't helping at all. And then right in the middle of his sermon, he stopped. He closed his eyes for just a second, and he looked up. He said, the Lord just spoke to me. There's somebody here today, and you're here because Jesus wants to change your life. And I didn't know anything about how to act in church, so I just jumped up, raised my hand. I said, that's me. <laughs> and I, I walked forward, and I knelt down, and I knew how to pray. And I just said, Jesus, I'm tired of doing wrong, and I want to do what's right. Would you please change my life? And that was the first day of my new life walking with Jesus and all I ever wanted was to make sure that everybody had a chance to know the God who changed my life he had given me everything and I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anybody else like me out there who didn't know who didn't have a chance and I set my life on that trajectory of God send me to the place put me in a place where people don't know you and I've spent my life trying to do that. And I think I'm just walking in the footsteps of Jesus. You know, when Jesus started his ministry, you know, he's walking along one day. This is after the baptism. Uh, he was baptized. He's walking along one day. And it says that John the Baptist sees him. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And he's got two disciples following him, and then they start to think, well, why are we following this guy? I mean, if he's the one, let, let's go follow him. So they just turn around, and Andrew and Philip, and they just start walking behind Jesus. And I don't know, if have you ever had that impression that somebody's watching you? Have you ever been there? You know, somebody's following you? So he turns around, and there they are. And Jesus gives them one shot. One shot. What do you want? Man, can you imagine Jesus giving you one shot? <laughs> Any question you ever wanted to ask. I mean, I've got some good ones. Where did Adam and Eve find wives for those boys? I mean, I've got some good questions. And I'm going to get to heaven and I'm going to ask Jesus. And these guys got one shot. What do you want? And they're obviously brain damaged. And all they can come up with is, where do you live? Where, what's your address? That's all you got. Where do you live? I mean, you could have asked his mother and got that answer. You didn't, you didn't even ask him. Where do you, I always thought it was the strangest question until I lived in Asia. And I realized in Asia, we see stuff all the time. We see stuff all the time. I had a Buddhist monk who got saved, and, uh, and he was levitating off the floor while we were praying for him. And God delivered him. We see stuff all the time. I, I saw a young girl lift a grown man off the ground one time who was demon-possessed. I've seen craziness. In Asia, we've seen stuff. And what these guys are saying is, We've heard a lot. We were there when you were baptized. We were right there with John. We, we heard a voice and all these wonderful things. We've, we've heard the testimony of our master. We've seen things with our own eyes. But one thing we need to know before we join in with you, and what we need to know is, how do you treat your mother? What we need to know is, how do you treat people in your community? How does it look in real life? And before we jump in, we need to sit at your table. And Jesus did the exact opposite of how we do ministry in the church. Jesus said, come and you'll see. Come on over to my house. Jesus began with the word come. Everybody say come. In church... We like to use the word go. You want to know about Jesus? Man, you should go talk to my pastor. You want to know what God's like? Man, you should go to church on Sunday. 
I got a great book for you to read. You should go read this. We got a class. You need to go to that class. We're always pushing people out of relationship. The power of the life and ministry of Christ is that he offered people to come into direct relationship with him. To me, the most powerful verse of Scripture is this, John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came down and dwelt. He lived among us. He shared life with us. He ate with us. He walked with us. Jesus came down to restore the relationship that we were created for. You see, this is the story of salvation. The story of salvation is not simply that God has redeemed you. The real story of salvation is that God has reconciled you to himself. You see, redemption is only the means to reconciliation. The goal is the reconciliation of all things. Redemption is not the goal. It's part of the place that gets us to reconciliation, right relationship with God. And that's what we were created for. You see, in the beginning, you know why there's a trinity? Because God is love, and love cannot be expressed in a vacuum. So in the beginning, there had to be this, uh, this, this being that existed in a higher plane than us, that in three persons, so that love could be expressed, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And then they decided, Let, let's create so that we can share this love with others. And they created the earth, and they said, we can't share our love with the earth created the birds and the fish well we can't share our love with the birds and fish created all the animals we can't share our love with the animals and then they created took took out of the mud and created a man took out of the man and created a woman and in this you see the very purpose of God that every night God would come down and just walk through the garden with the man and woman that's what you were created for You were created simply to walk with God, simply to have intimate fellowship with God. And I can imagine God and Adam and Eve just kind of walking around and and God saying, hey, what'd you call that animal? And they tell me, yeah, I like that name. What do you think about that fruit over there? Oh, that's a great one. I love that. And they just shared life together. And in the middle of sharing life, though, God had to create choice because you cannot love without choice. And so God created a choice. He created one thing out of all of the fruit and all of the vegetables and all of these wonderful things. God put one thing and said, you just can't have that one thing. And they just had to have it. And we like to think that death was the ultimate result of sin. But the first act, the result of sin, was a breakdown of relationship between God and man. And the breakdown of relationship, if you are not in right relationship with God, you can't be in right relationship with one another. So as soon as the relationship with God broke down, their family dynamic also broke down, and then the community dynamic broke down, and before you knew it, the story of the Old Testament is the story of what happens when people are not in right relationship with God, that that lack of relationship feeds over into every part of our life. And then Jesus came and dwelt among us. He came to start this process of reconciliation to bring us back into right relationship with himself. And that part, the start of it, the end was the cross, but the start was sitting around at a table. The start was just walking through life with those who needed him the most. If we are going to see people transformed in our societies, rarely is anyone changed by a stranger. Rarely ever is anyone transformed by a stranger. If there will be transformation, it is because we took the time, we took the energy, we took the focus to say, I will spend my life with those who need Jesus the most. When's the last time you had a meal with somebody who really needs Jesus? I'm not talking about preaching at somebody. 
I'm not talking about going into a ministry conversation with someone, but someone in your community that needed Jesus, that you made a determination to come into relationship with them. Without relationship, we will never see change in our communities. Jesus, with Matthew the tax collectors, he went in straight into relationship with him, and they all complained, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? With Zacchaeus, he calls him down out of a tree, and, he, and it says that Zacchaeus welcomed him gladly into his home, and all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Jesus sat at the table of lepers, Pharisees, tax collectors, and sinners. Immoral women came to the table and washed his feet. He was constantly putting himself in a situation that religious people would not like. And at some point, you have to determine what you desire more. The reputation you have as a religious person or the desire you have to see Jesus Christ glorified. Because walking the path that glorifies Jesus will often put you in the path of the arrows of the religious. We have to make a determination. Come and see the home as the center of ministry, sharing life. The gospel doesn't need a pulpit. The gospel needs a table. You know, when I first went to India, all I knew was uh, I went to Bible school and I went to India. So I just did what they told me. Man, I, I put a backpack on every day for almost 15 years. And I'd walk and I would preach and I'd pass out tracts. In the nights, I'd take the Jesus film and show it. And once I'd walk through my little town, I started walking a little bit farther. And then I had to spend the night, and I'd come back. And then I'd reached all of them. I walked a little bit farther. And by the end, I spent two weeks out of every month. I would just walk for two weeks. And then I'd come back home and spend two weeks at home. And I did that for about 15 years. Just preaching. Just going. Sharing. And in all those 15 years... Never once did a Hindu walk into my house to eat because uh, I'm the missionary. And if they were to come to my house, they were afraid of consequences. What's going to happen to us? Not once did a Hindu invite me to come to their house and eat. And the church was small. The churches we planted were small, but we did our best. And then God did something radical to me. I was doing good, feeling good, and then out of nowhere, I felt like God told me to go to Laos. And Laos is this closed, tiny, communist nation, the most anti-Christ of nations that I've ever been in. Actually, the government of Laos used to have on their website, Christianity is the number one enemy of the state of Laos. They hated Christians, hated the church. Pastors were thrown in prison Bibles burnt, churches burned down. Very antichrist. And so God's calling us to go to Laos. And I can't get a missionary visa to Laos, so I'm just praying, God, what do you want us to do? And I uh, met a guy on an airplane one day, and he gave me a school. That's just how God works. He does stuff like that. So he just gave me a school. I met this guy on a plane, and a couple days later, he sent me an email saying, hey, I don't know if you remember me. We met on a plane, and uh, I've got to leave Laos, and I've got a school, and I want it closed down, and felt like God told me to give you the school. So he gave me the school. And so I went to Laos, and now I'm the principal of a school. And if you know anything about me, you know I hate school. So it was, <laughs> I mean, this, that was not an easy task. So I'm the principal of this school. And so here I am in Laos. I can't pass out a track. I mean, they warned me. The old school missionaries who had been in Laos warned me. If God called you to be in Laos, he just called you to pray. Just keep your mouth shut. Because if you go off and you give somebody a track, if you preach, you will be in prison. You will be dead. You will be out, but you will not be here. So just you, you're going to have to keep your mouth shut. And so I get to Laos with my family and I prayed, and I said, Lord, you brought us here. What do you want us to do? And I'll never forget. I heard that still, small voice of the Lord. The Lord spoke to me and said, open your home and open your life. 
I said, all right. So I went to school. We had about 300 students. This is college and above age professionals who wanted to learn English. So I went to every classroom the first day, and I said, I'm the new principal. And I had a sheet of paper with my address on it. And I said, this is where we live. And I want you to know our house is always open. Anytime you want to come by, you want to come for a meal, you want to come hang out, we're here. Please come see us anytime. We went through my little neighborhood. We lived in a little thatch roof neighbor village. And I went through the neighborhood. I got somebody to come and translate for me. I didn't even speak the language then. Went to every house with my family and said, hey, we're the new people in the village. And we want you to know our house is always open. My kids got toys, and we got a TV. Nobody else in the village had a TV. I said, we got a TV. You can come watch our TV. Your kids can come play with our kids' toys. Whatever. Our house is open. And people took us up on it. And so for the next six years, my wife will testify, we never had less than 20 people eat with us every day for the next six years. On Saturdays, we opened up, we called it English Club. We said, come practice English. At least 100 people would show up at our house every Saturday. And we just, we just hanging out with people, just sharing life with people. So this is going on for three months. I hadn't preached. I hadn't passed out a track. I'm just, we just feed a lot of people, basically. And I can barely talk to them because I'm just starting to learn the language. And after three months, we're sitting around the table, and the only religious thing I did for the first three months, I would always pray for the food. And I would just tell them, we like to give thanks to our God for blessing us with food. And I'd always pray for the food. So three months in, I stand up at the table, and I pray for the food. And when I sit down, this little Lao girl stands up at my table. She said, I'm ready. I want to be a Christian. And when she said that, my heart just sank. Because just that week, some missionary had called me and said, hey, you've been there a while. It's going to happen. They're going to send a spy to trap you to get you thrown in prison. Somebody's going to try to get you to baptize them or do something so they can throw you in prison. So be careful. So she stands up and says, I want to be a Christian. My heart sank. I thought, this is it. <laughs> so I told her, I said, hey, you need to come in the back. And so I took her in the back with my wife. And I said, uh, now I've never said the word Christian around you. I said, uh, do you know what a Christian is? And she said, mm, not really. She said, in our history books, we're told that the Americans who bombed our country, that they were Christians, and you're an American, so I assume you're a Christian. I said, okay. A bomber. Yeah, okay, got it. <laughs> I said, uh, do you know who Jesus is? And she thought a minute. And she said, oh, yeah. She said, I've heard you say that name every time you talk before we get to eat. But now I don't know who he is. So now I'm convinced this girl's a spy. I said, well, if you don't know what a Christian is, and you don't know who Jesus is, by the way, he's our God, then uh, why in the world would you say you want to be a Christian? She said, uh, we don't come to your house because we don't have food. We got food at our own house. She said, I keep coming back to your house because you got something in your house I don't have. We don't have peace in my home. She said, I've seen you with your family, and there's something different about your life. And I'm assuming it has to be because of your God. And well, whoever your God is, I just want to know your God. I want to have that kind of peace in my life. And we started a group. I said, all right, let's, let's start. We'll start studying the Bible together. I'm going to start teaching you. So we started meeting for prayer in the morning. About a month later, her sister corners her one day and said, what happened to you? Something's different in you. And then her sister started coming. And then the best friend started coming. And then the best friend's family started coming. And before we knew it, we had over 40 small groups taking place in our city, just sitting around a table never had more than 20 people in a place because it was dangerous. Some of those people went on to prison to martyrdom, but they keep growing, just sitting around a table, just sharing life together, sharing hope together. It is at the table. And I think God took me there to learn those lessons. So then coming back to India, I thought, God, what am I going to do now? God calling me back to India. So I decided, I'm not going to start another church. I'm going to start a gym. That sounds very unspiritual, doesn't it? So instead of buying a sound system, I bought some barbells and weights. <laughs> and I went to my town, the town I'd lived in for 15 years, 
and I started a gym. And I went through town and told everybody, hey, we got a gym if you guys want to come. And people started coming. And now, every week, about 70, 80 guys come to my gym. Easter Sunday, I told them, I said, hey, let's go out for a picnic for Easter Sunday to celebrate. 30 guys from the gym, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs, went with me, and we had a, uh, we had a Easter morning service where we shared the gospel with them. Out of that group now, 20 of them are now coming to Bible study on a regular basis. Five of them now have made decisions and are in a discipleship group growing in their faith. I've reached more people with a gym than I ever reached with a church. <laughs> you see, there are people in your community that no matter how well you do church, they're not coming in the door. They've been hurt. They've been offended. They have wrong ideas. There's something going on that it's not that they don't like Jesus. They just don't like us. <laughs> and somebody's got to go prove otherwise. I mean, some of you need to go out and instead of hanging out at the church all the time, you need to go hang out at the gym or hang out at the coffee shop or go find somewhere to hang out where people need Jesus. <laughs> We will not change our world just by hanging out together. Hear me. The goal of following Christ is not to go to heaven. That's where we get mistaken. Because if the goal of following Christ is to go to heaven, you will not spend your time with sinners. Because sinners may drag you down. The goal of life is not to go to heaven. The goal of life is to bring the glory of God down to this earth. Yes, we get to go to heaven one day. Yes, we get to be with Jesus one day. But if Jesus saved you to go to heaven, he would have taken you the day he saved you. Because it's dangerous to leave you here. You may backslide. Right? So if Jesus just saved you to go to heaven, we need to change our techniques, and we just need to call people forward, and we need to pray for them. And now, are you sure? Are you sure in your heart? And then we just take out a gun. Boom. Praise the Lord. Another one's gone to heaven. <laughs> and then you get to go to prison and you can reach all the prisoners there. I mean, that's a, this is a good plan, guys. But God did not save you to go to heaven. He saved you to reveal the glory of God here on this earth. Yes, we need fellowship together. Yes, we need to encourage one another. But we need to encourage one another to go out on the front lines and then come back and share the testimony of what God has done in our lives and then go back. I want to encourage every one of you in here. Set it as a goal. You know, we started like this in Laos. After our first people, we started. And one day, just God gave me this. It means every year, every disciple, make one disciple. That, that doesn't sound like a revolution, does it? Until you think about the power if every year, every disciple would make one disciple. I mean, if you started with 50 people this year, and then you had 100 next year, and then you had 200 the next year, and then you had 400 the next year. That's half the towns in Nebraska that everybody saved. <laughs> we can do that in four years. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's not rocket science. It is simply making disciples who make disciples. You don't need to get people saved to come and sit and listen to you. You walk in relationship with people so that they learn how to walk in relationship with others. And they carried on. I, I saw these statistics that, that uh, you know, sometimes I see things. When my wife isn't with me, I, I start saying things I shouldn't say. My wife is usually on the front row, you know, giving me choke signs and saying, calm down, honey. It's all right. Don't get angry. But she's not here. So I, I saw these stats on Facebook. This church put these stats up online. It was their stats for the year in review. And here was the statistics that they put up. 
for last year, 1,941 salvations. Praise the Lord. That's, that's a good number, right? 1,941 salvations. Listen to this. 60 baptisms and 120 baptisms in the Spirit. Now, I want you to notice this. A couple of things I want you to notice. The salvation number is very uh, precise, and the baptism and the Holy Spirit numbers look like guesses. <laughs> 60 and 120, that looks like a guess, right? <laughs> We're just guessing on those because we don't have cards filled out like we do for the salvations. Here's what I want you to see about that. <laughs> If 1,941 people were saved and only 60 took baptism, that means that probably the majority of those people that were saved were people from a Christian background. Just, uh, you know, backsliders from another place and we just shifted them over our way. Or, probably even more likely, most of those salvations were just one-off conversations in the park. And what we like to call a salvation was just a good day of witnessing. <laughs> somebody, do you understand that? <laughs> just because somebody said a prayer with you, and I was a heathen, <laughs> and if somebody would have pressed me, I'd have let you pray for me. Nobody tried it, but I'd have let you. <laughs> just because I didn't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> now, how do I get rid of you? <laughs> I got to repeat after you for a couple of hours. Sure, let's go for it. It doesn't mean anybody got saved. You see, salvation requires a level of relationship. It requires, come, follow me. Come and walk with me. Come, let's do this thing together. Salvation is not just a prayer that you pray. It is entering into relationship with Christ and his people. And without relationship, there's no real salvation. You know, Think of relationship when you think of the parable of the sower. You see, every level of the sower speaks about deepening levels of relationship. You see, it, it, the seed that falls on the road, no farmer purposely put seed on the road, right? Just kind of fell out of his pocket, fell off the tractor. Nobody purposefully put seed on the road. And sometimes, though, miracles happen. How many of you ever seen in the middle of the highway a corn stalk coming up, Right? Miracles happen sometimes. But because there's no relationship, it does no good, right? It's no good. It just fades away. See, that's what happens with our big, massive track drives, right? We're just kind of randomly throwing seeds around and expecting and hoping for miracles. And every once in a while, a miracle happens, and then we, we testify about that one miracle. You know, rather than spending hundreds of hours passing out tracks, you'd have done better to take one person and spend hundreds of hours drinking coffee with them, <laughs> sharing life with them, walking them through. And then some, it says, fell on the rocks. And if you go into Israel, you'll see that, you know, because the ground is so rocky, they take the rocks from the field and throw it to the edge. So on the rocks, this is, this is the edge of the field. The farmer's really not taking care of the edge of his field. The seed that was planted on good ground, but the, the thorns and the weeds came up. The farmer took the time to till the field. He took the time to put the seed in the ground, but then he walked away. And it still didn't produce any fruit. And the seed that produces fruit is the seed that the farmer stays in relationship with the field. I mean, he took the time to take all the rocks out. He took the time to till the soil. He took the time to put the seed down in it. He took the time to water it. He took the time to spend the night watching so the animals didn't eat it up and the thieves didn't take it away. He took the time to weed it every day. And the field that produces is the field that the farmer stays in relationship with. If you want to see transformation... It only comes through depth of relationship. The most fertile ground for the gospel is the ground that has been tilled with relationship. 
Because whether you like it or not, everything you ever say is processed through the prism of trust. I mean, whatever you say to me, I'm only going to take it to the level that I trust you. And when I know you, and I know you care about me, and I know you got my best interest in heart, I'm willing to listen to almost anything you say, and I'll at least think about it. That's what relationship does. If we are going to see relationship, we have to do more than activities in our community. We need to have relationships in our community with those who need Jesus the most. Relationships. You know, whenever we see stories like the story of the woman at the well, we love to pick it apart to find a new and great evangelism technique, right? You ever heard one of those sermons about, you know, the technique of how Jesus manipulated this woman down the road and get her to the right place? So, so I say this, then you say that, and then I say this, and you say that. The problem is most sinners aren't smart enough to give the right answer. So I say, if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? And they're supposed to say, I'm going to hell. But no. They say, I think I'm a pretty good guy. I think I'm going to heaven. And then you just threw my whole technique off. Hold on, hold on. Let's, let's back up. Let's start over again. Let's try again. But Jesus wasn't modeling for us a technique of evangelism with this woman. What he was really showing us is what happens when you take time to sit with those who need him the most. When you take the time to look beyond the exterior and you're willing to sit down and to share your life with somebody who needs Jesus. The power of relationship. We don't spend enough time with the lost. You know, I know when I got saved, first scripture that was ever dropped on me, first scripture I was ever told to memorize, come out from among them and be separate right? That was early Pentecost. <laughs> Come out from among them and be separate. So the week I was saved, a group of deacons and elders came to my house, and they came to purge my house. All my Budweiser t-shirts and beer t-shirts, my ACDC posters on the wall, all of my cassettes, <laughs> they threw them in this thing, put some gasoline in it, and we started praying, and then somebody lit it up. Boosh. Man, it was a spiritual experience. <laughs> Until I realized, I don't have any more clothes. <laughs> you burned all my clothes. <laughs> and I was warned, man, you, you, gotta, you gotta be careful. Stay away. You know, all your old friends, man, they, they're gonna drag you down. You need to stay away. You need to be careful. So my old friends would call me up and say, hey, we're going out tonight. You want to go? Uh, I'm going to church. You want to come to church with me? No, we don't want to go to church. Okay, I got to stay away. About graduated Bible school, came back, and now I feel strong enough. So I called one of my friends up one night, and I said, uh, hey, why don't we go out and get something? He said, I haven't heard from you in five years. I said, yeah, I know. I've, I've been gone. He said, we were there for you when your family left you. And then you, you claim to have found the greatest thing in the world, and then you abandon us. I, I, we're really not interested. I can understand that. You know, my house now, we have friends coming in and out all the time. Thanksgiving, I invited all my friends from the gym and all my friends, I started a coffee shop, all my friends from the coffee shop to come. 150 people came to our house for Thanksgiving dinner. 150. And you know why people don't like to share their life? Because it's hard. Because at my house that day, there were Muslims, about 20, 30 Muslims. There was about 50 Hindus. There were 30 or 40 Sikhs. There were Buddhists that are there. They all have different diets. They all have different restrictions. And my wife, man, my wife is just, she's a jewel. And so she started cooking. She cooked for five days. She labeled all the food, halal, 
which is meat that is kosher that Muslims will eat. So she went to the mosque and bought halal meat so that our Muslim friends could come and eat. She went and figured out how to make great vegetarian food so all of our Hindu friends could eat. You can't even put eggs into the, into the cakes because that makes it non-vegetarian. So she had to figure out how to make all the cakes without eggs. And she, she went through this. It took her weeks to figure out all this kind of stuff and fed 150 people. And now, on a daily basis, I sit in my house and Muslims walk into my house and we sit around and talk about life. I talk about Jesus and I pray for them. And they receive it with gladness. I have a Hindu young man who uh, just a couple of months ago, he was uh, talking to his sister and he was telling his sister something. And then he, he, said, uh, he said to his sister, he said, you know, you should pray to Jesus. And then he said, he said, and he was telling me, he's relaying this story to me. He said, you know, you should pray to Jesus. Then he said, oh, I think I'm a Christian. <laughs> and so he came back and told me, he said, hey, I think I'm a Christian. I said, well, that's great. Glad to hear. <laughs> he didn't say a prayer or anything. He just decided, you know what? I'm following Jesus. I've done it. And he sat at my house just a couple of days ago with tears in his eyes. He said, how do I see my father come to faith? I want to see my whole family. And we talk for hours about how he could start to share this love with his family. Just sitting around, drinking coffee, drinking tea, sharing life, relationship. There is power in sharing our lives with those who need Jesus the most. If we are not careful, we can spend a lifetime saving ourselves while the world perishes around us. John said, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Come into fellowship with us so that you can walk into fellowship with Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, the apostle Paul said, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel, but also our own selves because you had become dear to us. Sharing the gospel is easy. Having a Saturday where you go out and pass out tracks, that's easy. But bringing people into your life, sharing your life, that's tough. Because hurting people hurt people. You start to bring hurting people into your life, and you'll find your phone ringing at 2 o'clock in the morning. You start bringing hurting people into your life, you start getting calls from the police station, somebody that's given you as the reference, and you got to go pick them up. It's a lot easier just to live our cleansed Christian life rather than sharing our life with those who need Jesus the most. This became one of my life scriptures recently, Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 15. Ezekiel said, And I came to the exiles at Tel Aviv who were dwelling by the Chabar Channel, and I sat where they were dwelling. I sat there overwhelmed among them for seven days. And if you go on to read, Ezekiel said, And I had visions of God. You know where the vision starts? Vision starts when you sit with the captives. We spend too much time sitting in an office rather than sitting by the canals of life, sitting in the coffee shop, sitting with the hurting, sitting with the broken. I want to challenge you. You have got to find a way to connect yourself with people who need Jesus. The majority of the people in your town who need Jesus are not going to walk through the doors of your church. Fifty years ago, if you wanted to reach your community, all you had to do was do church well. And at some point in the lifetime of every person, they would walk into the doors of a church. They would have a crisis. They would have, it would be a, a Christmas or an Easter, and they would decide to come into church. That's not the world that we live in today. The world that we live in today, we are in a post-Christian era in America where the majority of people that you desire to reach are not going to come to you. 
you're going to have to make a decision. What do the people I'm trying to reach like to do? And I'm going to go do it with them. If the people I'm trying to reach like to ride a bike, then buy a bicycle and start riding a bike. <laughs> if the people I'm trying to reach like to sew, then buy you a needle and start to sew. If the people you're trying to reach like to drink coffee, then go buy a mug and go drink some coffee. You are going to have to integrate your life. That is what Jesus did. It is called incarnation. That we incarnate our lives with those who need Jesus the most. We sit with them. We share life with them so that we can share truth with them. This is what Christ has called us to do. And I'm telling you, without relationship, you can grow your church without relationship. Because there's always somebody frustrated at their church. <laughs> you grow your church without relationship. You can build a great ministry without relationship, but you will not see transformation of lives without relationship. You will never see revival move through your city without relationship. You will not see college campuses reached without relationship unless you're willing to bring people into the core of your life. You're not going to see it. And I pray the Lord would help us today. For all of you taking ordination now, set yourself on a journey. Jesus, you brought me back into relationship with you. And now I want to bring others into this relationship. I want to bring people in my town who need Jesus the most. I want you to set every one of you in this building. Set it as a goal. This week, I want to eat with somebody who needs Jesus. I want to actually have a friend who doesn't like Jesus. I've got an atheist friend in India. We've been eating together almost every week for about three years now. And for the first two years, he didn't want to hear anything. And now, almost every time we're together, he asks me, hey, would you be praying for me? Relationship softens the heart opens the door. I want to encourage you, open your life. Would you do this with me? I want you to just begin to think right now and ask the Lord for that creative genius of the Spirit. I want you to ask the Lord right now by His Spirit to start to open your eyes to reveal to you who are people in my community? Who are people in my community who are not at the table yet? I want you to think about your church. And then I want you to think about your community. Is your church reflective of your community? And if not, who's not at your table? Who's not at your table? Is it ethnic groups that are not at your table? Are there some groups from outside of America who are coming in that are not at your table? Is there age groups that are not at your table? Who's not at your table? Who's not coming and tasting and seeing how good the Lord is in your community? And then I want you to begin to ask the Lord, Lord, would you bring me into relationship with people from that community? God, would you give me the creative spark to know how I can start to integrate my life with people in my community who don't know you? Lord, what can I do to open myself up to relationship so that people in my community who have been untouched, unreached, can come into relationship with you. Father, I pray right now for your people, especially for these ordination candidates, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you would give us the creativity, Lord God, that only comes by your Spirit. Give us the courage, Lord God, to share our lives with those who need you the most. Lord, I pray that there would be a day that we would be accused of being friends of sinners. I pray that there would be a day that the religious folks of our communities would look down on us because of the deep, meaningful relationship we have with broken and hurting people. 
Lord, I just pray that you would help us to make a difference in our communities, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to open up our lives. Lord, give us those opportunities to sit among broken people. Lord, help us to get out into our community and to walk our streets, to live our lives outside, outside of the walls of, these, of the church so that people would see the glory of who you are. Lord Jesus, help us to model for the people of our congregations, to model a life that is lived among broken and hurting people. Father, give us the courage to do it, I pray. I pray that everyone in this building, that over the coming days and weeks, that you would open them up, Lord God, to relationships with those who desperately need you. I pray that there would come a day that they begin to disciple and lead to faith people, Lord God, from backgrounds who have never entered into the doors of a church. Lord, I thank you that you have brought the world to Nebraska. I thank you that you are bringing in the Somali, the Saudi, the Sudanese, the Indian, the Chinese. Lord, you are bringing the world to us. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us that creative genius to, to be able to, Lord, intersect our lives with these communities that you have brought to us. Lord, I pray that there would be a day that the churches of Nebraska would represent every people living in Nebraska. I pray there would be a day that Muslims are coming to know you because we are living for you. I pray there would be a day that Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs are coming to the foot of the cross and finding hope and joy in you because of how we've lived our lives. Lord Jesus, bless your people today. Bless them, Lord God, and use them, Lord, to make a difference right here in Nebraska and around the world. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Joseph. As you were speaking, I, I remembered a quote I once heard that said, my life is God's currency. He can spin me as he chooses. Your life and your story are a, a reminder of that. And to all of you receiving credentials, it's uh, appropriate that you think of that in, con in your context too today, because this is your special day. The Assemblies of God has three levels of credentials, the first one being the Certificate of Ministry. This credential is given to those who fulfill the requirements, who pass tests and who interview. And these are people who show promise of usefulness in the gospel work. They're following what they believe to be God's call. And we believe that as God confirms that call, it'll be more and more clear as time goes on. Pastor Bob and Connie, please take your place. And as I call your name, please come and meet our superintendent and his wife. Receive a gift that they have for you. Cody Allen. Jake Ferris. Ruben Flores. Kevin Fox. Yeah. 
Emma Holbrook. She's not able to be with us tonight. Corey Johnson. Danny Nelson. Jesse Norman, not able to be with us tonight. Andy Perez. Larry Russell. Amber Shestock. Javen Troyer. Cody Wilson. As you see, the Certificate of Ministry recipients have received a towel of service representing a beginning point in ministry, serving the Lord, serving His church, learning what God has in store for them as their calling continues. If you're comfortable, please lift a hand out toward them as I pray this blessing on these. Lord Jesus, thank you for these these ones who have heard you call and they've said, yes, Lord. They don't fully understand where that yes will take them. But Lord, you don't call us to understand everything. You call us to go. You call us to obey. You call us to follow you. You call us to lay our lives before you and you will do with our lives what you choose. And so these recipients of certificate of ministry as we reach our hands out toward them we pray God that you will continue to direct them every step of their way make the the next steps clear to them and known to them when it's time for that and Lord direct them in the way that they should go as they show usefulness in the gospel ministry I pray that you would show them exactly how they could fulfill your purpose for them. And so we pray blessing on them now. In the name of the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ, we pray blessing. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand as they be seated. As they return to their seats, we will prepare for those receiving the license. It's, this, it's the next level of credential that the Assemblies of God has. After having proven, proven some usefulness in the gospel work, there comes a stage we call license. Some may call it apprentice. It's a period where God continues to refine that call on the way to ordination. As I call your name, please come as the certificate 
of ministry recipients did receive a gift from our superintendent and his wife. Matt Casey. Dave Cum Cumming. <laughs> Isaiah Fern is not able to be here tonight. Laura Franks. Autumn Holt and Brent Holt, unable to be with us tonight. Pete Morgan. Kenny Schwartz. Jennifer Vandeman. <laughs> Assistant Superintendent Gary Hoyt, these are the license recipients for 2018. Thanks so much, Terry. Would you join me in praying over each of these now who are taking this big important step let's all pray together heavenly father we're so grateful in our heart for the for the passion that each of these individuals has for you god we're thankful for their desire to serve you and and to do whatever it, uh, whatever you call them to do and be obedient to your voice father i pray you'll stir up uh, inside of them a, a, an ever growing desire to be a vessel for you and a, a vessel of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that they will not uh, rest on or rely on their own strength, but they'll, they'll rely on your power, which works mightily in them and through them. Father, we pray that their lives would, would be marked with purity and, and righteousness and their, their disposition would be filled with humility. Father, all the days of their life, we pray that they will serve you passionately, wholeheartedly, and bring much glory and honor to your name, that they'll be a part of bringing the glory of heaven down onto earth as they proclaim the good news of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. 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 God bless each of you. And now we come to that important point in our gathering in which we ordain individuals into a lifelong call of full-time ministry. And when I say full-time, they may be bivocational. They, they may not be able to, uh, to receive any money at all from the ministry. But by full-time, I mean... Your full-time passion is to do everything he's called you to do. As I read these names, I want to invite each of you to come and you take a place across the front and uh, if you'd face the congregation at first, come when you're called if you would. First, Justin Adams. <clears throat> Justin and his wife Christine serve as lead pastor at Epic Church here in Lincoln. Kylie Calloway. Yeah. 
Kylie is the lead pastor in uh, Northfield Church in Garing, Nebraska. Next, we have a couple that's receiving ordination credentials the same night. First, Pastor Walter Hooker. And his lovely wife, Dr. Melba Hooker. Robert Ireland. Bob serves as director of evangelism at Flatland Church. James Lautzenheiser, Jr. Come, if you would, Jim. Jim serves as lead pastor of uh, Christian Life Center in O'Neill, Nebraska. Next, Amy Mitchell. Amy serves as children's and family pastor at Victory Road Assembly in uh, Norfolk. Next is Brian Steinbach. <laughs> Brian serves as a senior pastor of North Park Assembly of God in Holdridge, Nebraska. And Jennifer Wilkins. Jennifer serves as executive pastor at Flatland Church in Omaha. And last but certainly not least, Ashley Williams. <laughs> Ashley serves as the children's pastor at North Shore Church in Hastings, Nebraska. I want to invite you now, uh, each of you candidates and spouses of here, if you would turn around now and face this direction. I'd also like to invite the presbyters who, who are here to come and stand in front of each of these individuals. And then lastly, I'll invite uh, those who have been uh, asked to come and Pray with each of these individuals to come and stand by them as well. Superintendent Wine, uh, it is a great privilege to present to you these outstanding candidates for ordination and perhaps our largest class yet. Thank you, Gary. I... Uh... I'm deeply moved by this class. These are great people. You know, I look at some of you who I love so much, and we've tried to just encourage you to get ordained, and you stepped up and did it. I am so proud. I ask if you would now, Presbyters, if you would pass the candidates Bible to the presbyter if it hasn't been done already. Sometimes we tend to think of this as just a ritual or something you do in church life for some reason. And I would just like to say this is not just a ritual. This is a very sacred time. <laughs> I say that because you look at scripture when there was this kind of an ordination. And I think of an Exodus 29. You look in that, they, I mean, they were sacrificing animals and we're not gonna do that tonight. Thank God. But it was something they had to, and they wore a special garment. Your garment is a life. 
full of the Holy Spirit. And it's a representative of that. It's a time when you will receive a special anointing by the laying on of hands. And I just want to encourage you, think of this as a holy moment in your personal life. I'm going to share a vow. I'm going to read this and then ask you to respond at the end. Since an authentic disciple of our Lord is one who's become so ravished in, by Christ that others want to be like them, do you pledge yourself to continually be increasing in your knowledge and your love for Christ and God's Word? Do you pledge to give yourself wholeheartedly to walking worthy of his call, to make disciples who are also so ravished by Christ that others will want to be like him? Do you pledge to do your best to live a life dependent upon God's leading, his anointing, his timing, rather than your own preferences, your gifts? Are your skills will you pledge to strive in your relationship with your ministerial colleagues to reflect the self-giving love and oneness that's modeled even in the Godhead as newly ordained ministers of the Nebraska Assemblies of God the District Council do you affirm these vows you're taking? And if so, would you respond by saying, by God's grace, I will. In the presence of God and the and of Jesus Christ, who's going to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach. word this is something that the world needs to hear is the word be prepared in season out of season to correct to rebuke those are toughies and encourage with great patience and careful instruction but you Keep your head in all situations. There's going to be some times you feel like, whoa, what just hit? Endure hardships. Do the work of an evangelist, as we've just heard tonight, and discharge all the duties of your ministry. By the authority that's vested in us, the Presbytery of the Nebraska a District of the Assemblies of God, we now are going to be laying hands on you and ordaining you to the full gospel ministry in the church of Jesus Christ. Let me just explain how we can move forward with that. I would ask all those who are being ordained, husband and wife, if possible, to please kneel. I'm going to ask the congregation if you would stand, please. And I'd like you to extend your hand towards one of these individuals that you are close to, praying with them, for them. And the presbyters, I ask you to lay hands on them as well. And there's going to be one person especially that they're going to be praying for you, the one that you've asked. I'm going to begin a prayer, and then I'm going to pause, and I want you to be praying for them. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your presence in this place right now. We've sensed it, and we verbally accept that fact that you are here, and we acknowledge that. Now, God, hear the prayers that are offered up right now for these ordained ministers. Hear the prayers. Now I'm going to let you pray.
Heavenly Father, I ask now that you will empower them in a very special and unique way, even now in the name of Jesus. I pray for Justin Adams, Kylie Calloway, Melba Hooker, Walt Hooker, Bob Ireland, Jim Lautzenhauser, Amy Mitchell, Brian Steinbach, Jennifer Wilkins, Ashley Williams. God, I ask a special blessing on each one of them. May they sense your presence. And may this be a day of life change that they look back and they say, that's when that anointing came upon me in a very unique and special way. Thank you, God. On behalf of the Nebraska District Council and for the sake of the King and his kingdom, we now ordain you to the full gospel ministry in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And a rich evening and we want to say thank you for joining us tonight we have a reception across the hall and we're asking all of you to join us in the reception and those that are in the council we will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. amen amen praise the Lord praise the Lord <laughs>